the Germans had been stopped and hurled back. They had lost their first great battles of the war. Skillful Russian gunnery and unending vigilance had stymied the German blitz. As the tide began to turn on the German war machine in World War II, threats from above increasingly impacted their efforts. Whether this be strategic bombing campaigns against factories or close air support, the dwindling supply of planes and skilled pilots left forces on the ground at risk. While flak guns such as the renowned 88mm helped against the flying fortresses and other large bombers, these were far less effective against low-flying attackers, bombing and strafing units and supplies. Gunside aiming point cameras show some of the violent treatment 8th Air Force fighter pilots gave German ground targets in November. In order to protect against these, the German army would begin a variety of projects to create vehicles known as Flakpanzers. Today, we will look into the story of one of these built using a Panzer IV hull that you likely know as the Verbelwind. Before we get into the story of the Verbovin, though, I've got new merch which is now available. Continuing the animal theme, you can now get one based on the Lerva Super Heavy Tank design. Check out the link below to grab yourself one or any of my other designs and help support the channel. Now back to the regularly scheduled tank content. The development of German self-propelled anti-air vehicles during World War II in many ways parallels that of the tank destroyer or self-propelled gun. During the early parts of the war, AA guns were often transported via trucks or half-tracks, either being towed behind or in some cases in fixed mounts. These would then be driven into position and crewed to provide protection for various locations. However, while this could protect strategic locations, these were of little help to units on the offensive or as we see during the latter parts of the war, on the retreat. This same issue can be seen with anti-tank and artillery guns during the war, as the larger these weapons became, the harder it was to move them around using manpower, trucks, or in many cases, horses. The solution for all of these for Germany came in the form of what we now call the self-propelled gun, which as the name implies, allows for the gun or guns to be moved under its own power. For the larger cannons, this would come in the form of vehicles such as the Nashorn and Hummel, but the same concept was applied for new self-propelled anti-aircraft vehicles, or SPAA. The benefit of such a vehicle, as you can probably guess, is its ability to advance alongside other vehicles or infantry while also being able to quickly spring to action against enemy aircraft. Depending on the design, they can also protect the crew from enemy fire or shrapnel, something which is often inferior or even missing altogether on towed AA guns. By 1943, it was becoming clear to the German army that they could no longer rely on the Luftwaffe as the supply of both planes and pilots dried up. In response to this, programs were launched to create new vehicles which could offer protection to these vulnerable ground units. With German industry already struggling to produce tanks at a sufficient pace to keep up with demand, these new Flakpanzer vehicles needed to be built using vehicles which were already in production. Given that by late 1943 and into 1944, plans were already underway to phase out production for things like the Panzer III, aside from production of Sturmgeschütz, and demand for Panthers and Tigers was far too great to use those platforms, the responsibility for this AA defense would fall on the Panzer IV. Though these would not be the first Flakpanzers Germany designed or built, they would become some of the most produced examples. The first of these designs to be proposed and tested came in the form of the so-called Mobilwagen, which is German for furniture van. Although initially rejected by Hitler as being unsuitable in mid-1943, by October he had changed his mind ordering the design to be tested with a completed prototype being shown to him in December of that same year. This would mark the first step towards the Verbelwind, German for whirlwind, with it being equipped with a quad 2cm Flakwehrling 38 mount. During travel, the crew and gun were protected by two thin 10mm spaced plates creating a box-like appearance for the vehicle. 
Depending on the situation, these shields could be lowered partially or fully to provide more traverse for the gun. Only prototypes of the 20mm armed mobile Wagen would be built, however a version of it equipped with a single 37mm would enter production with around 200-250 to being built. While these were a relatively cheap option and proved to be at least reasonably effective, their limited protection left them at risk should the Allied planes target it. With these shortfalls in mind, a new set of requirements for future Flakpanzer designs was created. These were to have an armored, fully rotating turret for a 3-4 man crew, two or more guns, ability to effectively engage targets within 2,000 meters, total height of 3 meters or less, sufficient supply of ammunition, good turret access, ventilation and fume extraction for the turret, a full set of radio equipment. Interestingly though, the Werbelwind itself would not be the first vehicle built fitting most of these specifications. This would occur within the 12th SS Panzer Division who would create a field modification on some of their Panzer IVs to mount the 2cm Flak 38 Flakvierling in place of the original turret. Reportedly, three of these were converted with at least one of these being fitted with a crude armored turret. Despite being unaware of the true Flakpanzer developments, this design would end up helping to influence the final design of the Verbalwind, which would later replace it. A similar vehicle was also built on the Eastern Front using a captured T-34 around the same period, showing that the need was great enough that troops in the field had already begun taking matters into their own hands. By May of 1944, the first completed Verbalwind was displayed at Kummersdorf, with it receiving approval from both General Heinz Guderian and then later by Hitler himself. Similar approval would be given to the later Ostwind, which was quite similar in design to the Verbalwind, although featuring a single 37mm instead of four 20mm. The actual design of this new Flakpanzer was extremely simple, allowing for easy conversions of existing Panzer IVs. These were built on Panzer IV G, H, and J hulls which had been returned from the front for repairs. On top of these, a slightly modified quad 20mm mount was fitted into a thinly armored open top turret featuring 16mm of protection on all sides. Thanks to this thin armor though, the total weight of the vehicle dropped 2-3 to three tons depending on which variant was used. Initially, the turret was tested with a hydraulic traverse system which would have allowed for 60 degrees per second of horizontal traverse, but this would not be used in the production vehicle, likely due to cost and availability of parts. Bear in mind that by this point, the Panzer IV J had also had the powered traverse removed, so it is not surprising the Flak Panzer lacked this. However, this did reduce the traverse significantly with the production vehicle only having around 27 degrees per second. Other than that, the modifications to the Panzer IV chassis were minor. Several other potential modifications were proposed, including increased frontal turret armor, a folding armored shield for the commander, and holders for a canvas cover for the turret, but none of these were implemented. To feed this new armament, the Verbalwind was equipped with 3200 rounds of ammunition which were fed into the 20mm cannons from 90 20 round magazines. Additionally, 1,350 rounds were carried for the hull machine gun. The number of crew in the tank remained the same at 5 men, however, unlike the Panzer IV, the turret crew consisted of two loaders and a commander who would also act as the gunner. The remaining two crew would sit in the hull, acting as the driver and radio operator. Around the same time the Verbalwind was entering production, the German artillery branch similarly showed interest in Flakpanzer units to protect their vehicles. Tests to determine whether or not the Verbalwind and Ostwind turrets could be mounted on the Panzer III hull were undertaken in March of 1945. This was reportedly successful and proved that the Ostwind turret could be fitted to a Panzer III to create a Flak Panzer III. Given the similarities, we can likely assume this would mean the Verbalwind turret could similarly be fitted, but we cannot say for certain. It is also unclear if any Flak Panzer III Ostwind vehicles were actually built. Regardless of how far along this project got, it was cancelled later in March. One additional project built on the Verbalwind to replace the quad 20mm armament with four 30mm cannons saw development. 
known as the Zerstörer 45 or Destroyer 45, tests using a mobile Wagen were reportedly undertaken with up to two potentially being fitted into unaltered Verbalvin turrets. Again though, this would not progress any further and information surrounding these prototypes are quite limited. As for the 20mm armed Verbalvins, these would begin to be delivered in July of 1944 with an initial order for 80. By the time production ended in 1945, somewhere between 105 and 122 were produced with sources differing on the exact number. These would be distributed among Panzer units including the aforementioned 12th SS Panzer Division who had helped inspire the design. These would see service on both the east and western fronts with most initially being sent west. As you can likely guess, they were to provide security to the tank units they were attached to engaging enemy aircraft when they appeared. This was not to be done by firing at planes flying overhead in an attempt to deter them, but rather to target and attempt to down aircraft. Likely this distinction was to prevent the crews from wasting ammunition, although it would help prevent the fighters from easily spotting them as well. Considering a full platoon of these vehicles only consisted of eight split into two groups of four each, any losses could prove incredibly detrimental to their overall effectiveness at protecting the tanks they were assigned to. Verbalvins were also used in ground support roles providing direct fire against infantry, anti-tank guns, and other soft targets. One account during the Battle of the Bulge showcases this as an American AT gun knocked out two Mobilwagens before being engaged by a Verbalvind which caused the crew to abandon the weapon. Considering this reportedly occurred at a distance of only 50 meters, it's no surprise they were quick to make themselves scarce when multiple 20mm guns opened up on them. Overall, it appears that the Whirlwinds performed well in both their role as anti-air vehicles as well as ground support. With their quad 20mm guns on a mobile chassis, they were able to quickly and effectively respond to incoming aircraft, something the towed anti-aircraft guns and other AA vehicles were unable to do. Really, the only major problem with the Verbalvind was the fact that it came so late in the war and in such limited numbers. The fact that the Flakveerling it was equipped with was fed by only 20 round magazines did also somewhat reduce the fire rate, but this did not seem to hinder the vehicle too significantly. Still, along with both the Mobilwagen and the Ostwind, which eventually superseded the Verbalvind, the Panzer units were afforded at least some protection from the onslaught of Allied fighter bombers. Of the vehicles built, only two survive today, with one example in the Historical Military Anti-Aircraft Exhibition in Kiel, Germany, alongside other Flakpanzer designs, including a surviving Kugelblitz turret. As for the second survivor, it currently resides in Canada and has been undergoing an intensive restoration process by the aptly named Flakpanzer Restoration Project. I met some of the people working on this, as well as some staff at the Borden Military Museum where the tank now resides, and was able to see the current state of the project. Although it still has a ways to go and is currently awaiting reassembly, much of the work has been completed and the turret is now back on display indoors along with their other vehicles. It's clear this example saw combat as you can see both battle damage on the turret as well as writing in the driver's position. The tank itself seems to be a mishmash of parts with the upper hull appearing to come from a Panzer IV J and the lower hull likely from a Panzer IV H, making this a bit of a Frankenstein's Panzer. The story behind how it got to Canada is equally interesting with it being part of a collection pieced together after the war by a Canadian soldier named Farley Moat. The story of Farley Moat is an incredibly interesting one and is retold in the book My Father's Son if you'd like to read about it yourself, but I will also likely be covering it in a future video as he is responsible for many of the unique pieces of Axis technology now on display in Canada. He and his men even went so far as to steal a V-2 rocket from the British and disguise it as a submarine to sneak it back overseas. As for his Verbalvind, hopefully it will be back on display soon so anyone who visits the Borden Museum will get a chance to see this rare vehicle fully restored. As with many tanks of the mid to late war in Germany, the Verbalvind is a tale of a vehicle which was too little too late. 
While it did serve its purpose well and was a cheap solution to the problem it sought to answer, by the time it reached the battlefield, the war was practically over. Still, with its introduction, Germany fielded their first true Flakpanzer and would set the stage for vehicles like the Ostwind and Kugelblitz proving the viability of the concept. Even today, self-propelled anti-air vehicles remain in service around the world, remaining a vital layer of defense against aerial threats. Recent events between Russia and Ukraine have again shown the value of such vehicles to protect and support ground forces both from threats in the air and on the ground. What do you think about the Verbalvin, though? Am I right to say it was a design forged for battle, or am I wrong and should have put this in the cursed by design category? Let me know in the comments, and don't forget to check out the link below to buy my brand new Lerva themed merch design. You can also grab yourself a model of the Verbalvin, like the one you saw in this video, by checking out Warbricks USA, and if you use the code CONOVARC5, you can save 5% on your order. I also want to remind you that all the sources I used for this video are available in the description, so if you want to learn even more about the Verbalvin, you can check them out for yourself. And if you buy a copy of the books I used with my links, it helps support the channel as well as the authors. Special thanks to the staff at the Borden Military Museum for giving me the opportunity to see their Verbalvind in person earlier this year, and for all the work they and the Flak Panzer Restoration Project have done to preserve it. That's all I have for you today though, so I hope you enjoyed, and thanks as always to my YouTube members for supporting this content, even when the upload schedule gets a little messed up. Thank you all so much for watching, and if you want more Flak Panzer content, check out my previous video on the story of the Kugelblitz or on some of the Flak Panther concepts. Hope to see you there or on the next video.